The guy joining us on the line right now, you know, I've been uh, a poker player since I was, gosh, since I was 18 years old. I'm old, man. I'm 40 now. But household name, uh, he is a former professional player uh, who specialized in heads up, no limit, uh, made a lot of money playing online poker and uh, has an extremely large following. But we're not having Doug Polk on the show today to necessarily talk about poker. He has started a campaign to recall Las Vegas Mayor Carolyn Goodman. Uh, that is underway, and in fact, the mayor actually responded to this. We're going to talk to Doug Polk about that right now as he joins us right now on the line. Doug, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? No problem. Uh, I'm doing great. It's uh, good to get the message out there for what I've been working on lately, and uh, excited to talk about it. All right, so Doug, for me, my biggest issue with the mayor uh, started with that horrendous interview she did with Anderson Cooper on CNN. I thought she made herself look like a fool, and I happen to be – very close friends with Oscar Goodman. So this has been a very difficult subject for me. I think Carolyn Goodman is a very nice lady. I just think she's ill-informed, and she made herself look ignorant on national television. So tell me where it started for you uh, and where you're at right now, Think and your thoughts on Carolyn Goodman. It, it was a pretty similar starting point for me. When I saw that interview, I found it jarring to see a complete lack of understanding about the situation at hand. And there's a bit of, a bit of confusion, I think, about what we're trying to do here. I think some people are trying to make this out as political as possible and saying, you know, if you are for reopening, you know, you're a conservative. If you're against it, you're a liberal. Uh, and so anyone against Carolyn Goodman is a liberal who's just trying to keep America closed. And, and that just couldn't be farther from the truth for what we're doing here. The issue with that interview was that she showed a complete lack of understanding about just the basics of what was happening with this virus in a global sense, and also had no real actionable plan to be able to fix it. You know, I, I, my personal opinion is I think it, it was a little bit hasty to say we should reopen everything right now. Um, I think something more in line with, with what the governor has done is appropriate. But regardless, if she had said, look, you know, there's going to be some trade offs here. We have to understand the economic impact of this decision, uh, or rather the decision to stay closed. That economic impact on the families of Las Vegas will be as severe or more severe than the loss of human life. Right. Then that would have been a stance that I might not have agreed with, but I could have said, you know what, that, that makes some sense. I can see where they're coming from or where she's coming from. Yeah. And Doug, instead, she go, – go for uh, it. I'm sorry. To, uh, go ahead. Continue. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say when, when she comes on and she says that, you know, sort of like the jury's out on social distancing uh, yeah. or, or rather that, you know, we don't know what it would have been like with no social distancing. You know, this is a contagious virus. It spreads by being near people. I, no what question. is it supposed to mean? Yeah, no question. I, you're absolutely right. And I, by the way, I, I defend you and I defend uh, anybody. And for people that want to paint you out to be political or, or, or liberal and that sort of thing, I, I don't agree with that. Now, you made a very good point earlier, and I want you to touch base on this. Uh, in that interview with Anderson Cooper, it seemed to me, and I think you'll agree with me on this, that she seemed to be more sensitive to these casino owners' interest than the actual people that live here in Las Vegas. I think you agree with that. We'll talk a little bit about that. Totally agree with it. It's been one of my main sticking points here. Within that interview, she talked about how this shutdown is affecting the sensitive casino owners and how upset they are. And, you know, it just kind of shows what place she's coming from, right? Like if I, if I, if, if I was the mayor and I'm talking about what's happened to my city, I'm going to talk about the people, talk about the working class, talk about the families, talk about the people who have lost someone, talk about the families that are struggling financially, talk about the economic, economic impact on them. I'm not going to be like, oh, wow, these, these casino owners, which I know, by the way, they're, they're really upset right now. I mean, frankly, you know, who cares? Right. Like, is that is that really the most important thing here? Is this this handful of casino owners? There really aren't even that many and how they feel right now. Or are we going to talk about the hundreds of thousands of people that are in your your city that are hurting? Right. That that should be where it's coming from. And, and, and that's why if you want to have a strategy that's more aggressive, we should be talking about those aspects, not just trying to stick up for your buddies who I assume helps put you where you are today. All right, so so you you would think that she's not just friends with those casino owners, but she's actually make, getting some type of you know monetary compensation on behalf of them, and this is this is affecting that by having those casinos not open. I can't say for sure, so I'm going to be careful with the language that I choose. Right, but what I can say is, in a city like Las Vegas that is so casino based, 
it would not surprise me at all that a lot of the money she has raised or received is from these casinos. It wouldn't surprise me. I can't say that I know that for sure, but it's Las Vegas. So, Doug, talk to me a little bit now about this recall, Goodman. Uh, it's it, it, this type of petition, right, that you're trying to get as many signatures as you can. Can you explain to us why you decided to do this, how many signatures you have, and how many more you need in order for this to be effective and maybe work? Sure. So I decided to do this when I saw the interview uh, and I realized that this could have, you know, implications on me as someone that lives here in the Las Vegas Valley uh, and kind of what it made us look like to the rest of the world. You know, that interview it wasn't just a, a local thing where we saw the mayor. That was that was everyone. That was the country. That was other other countries saw this interview and saw what was happening here in Las Vegas. So it seemed dangerous and it it was embarrassing. And it felt like someone needed to do something about this. Now, of course, like politics has not been something that I have been in at all. Um, and I was just kind of watching back, seeing what would happen. I saw there was a change.org petition. I saw there were people talking about it. I saw a lot of upset people. But you know what I didn't see? I didn't see action. I didn't see people actually saying, you know what, I'm going to do the hard work and I'm going to try and lead something for change here. I saw a lot of people saying online they would, or a lot of people saying that someone should do something. So I thought to myself, you know what, maybe this is the, this is something that I can do. Uh, I, I'm in a place where I can spend time on something um, that I believe in and be able to do that. You know, I, I'm retired from poker, as you mentioned earlier. And let's just see what we can actually get done. So at least that's that's what I why I decided to go ahead and do it. What was your other question? Uh, he asked, "How many more signatures do you need to, to actually make it actionable?" So this is the this is the law in Nevada. It's not easy. We need twenty five percent of the signatures of people who voted in the last election. There were twenty seven thousand people that voted in the last mayoral election, which, by the way, is is an extremely low number. It's kind of it's it. it it's kind of a shockingly low number. I, yeah. I know that it's an off-year election. We're talking a 2019 mayor right. primary. This isn't the this isn't bringing home the bacon, right? People aren't real pumped to show up at the polls. But it's still <laughs> a very very low number, right? Uh, yeah, but so we need 25 percent of the 27,000 people that voted. So That's not going to be easy. Yep, go ahead. So you 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 need less than. Nine thousand signatures. That means six 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 thousand sixty five hundred. Yeah. Yeah. That that doesn't seem like that's that that's a ton. Uh. Well, you know, it depends how you want to look at it, right? If this was just I could get sixty, I think the actual number I need is sixty seven fifty or so is what the right. Secretary of State told me. Where are you at right um, now, Doug? How many do you have now? We're at zero, but I want to I want to just throw a caveat in there. We have probably fifty to a hundred people that want to sign right now. Gotcha. We're just making sure that the petition is 100% correct. Because I got you. if this is successful, sure. it's going to be challenged, right? We, yeah. we know that. Sure. So I, I'm making sure that we do this the right way. This sure. isn't we have zero because people don't want to sign. This no, is, I understand that. But together. I get it. Right, so, right. Doug, Doug, you're a guy with a huge social media platform. You're certainly a household name in the world of poker, and you're popular among poker players. You're, you're not a nobody here. I mean, you're a guy that's won over $9 million. You've got three World Series of Poker bracelets. And by the way, that $9 million is just from live tournament play uh, in the World Series of Poker, if, if I'm not mistaken. So you're, you're a prominent guy, certainly here in Las Vegas. This is just my personal opinion. I don't think it'll be that hard for you to get these signatures. I really don't. I think I understand where you're coming from. You want to make sure it's right before you get it out there. I actually think you're going to be able to get these signatures. What would you say to that? Well, I would say I'm excited if that's the case. You know, like this is, as I said earlier, this is the first time I, I've tried to do something in sort of the area of politics. Uh, so I'm not sure what to expect, right? And that was the other thing. This is a learning experience. I'm learning about what it, what it takes to lead a, a grassroots effort like this. Uh, all of the emails you have to respond, respond to, all of the people that you need to work with, all of the steps need to be in place. Um, I'm learning a little bit about the, the legal code as well, which wasn't something that I was planning on learning about, but here we are. Uh, I, I hope we can. I hope we can. We're going to have more information once we finally get it going, once we actually have people signing the petition. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to see if we can make it happen. 
I actually think you could probably get that just from poker players that live in Las Vegas or near that just from those people. You'll definitely so, get it from Daniel Negron. You, uh, yeah, you'll, N- N- Negron will be on board <laughs> for sure. He's been on our show a million times. So, he's not a mayor. So, Doug, you, you mentioned how she, she embarrassed the city of Las Vegas, and I agree. I think you know, actually bringing up the conversation she had with Jeremy Aguero about, about Las Vegas possibly being a control group was an absolutely insane thing to do. Have you had, and I'm sure you know a lot of poker players, not just in Las Vegas, but all over the country and the world. Have you had poker players that you know outside of Las Vegas actually talk to you and say, I'm I'm considering not coming back to Las Vegas because of what Mayor Goodman said in that interview? I don't think what she said is the reason that poker players would consider not playing. Poker players are are a special, a special breed. They're going to play poker unless it might cost them their lives. And I think it's the coronavirus that's, that's really keeping them away more than anything else. So, no, I, I don't think it's going to keep people away. All right, fair enough. Now, again, not to belabor the point, but you're a man w- with wealth, right? You've won a lot of money. You're, very, you're a very successful guy. And I don't want to stereotype those that have money as those that want everything to reopen, but let's just be honest about this. It's usually the people that are doing very well, the people that have a ton of money, that are with the mayor, not against the mayor. You're not one of those people, and I do appreciate that about you. Listen, you have a lot of money. You probably – want to go out and have a good time. You're, you're a fairly young guy and very successful. So this is obviously a, de- a detriment to you, as, as many others. You can't go out. You can't do the things you want to do. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment? Because I find that a lot of people that are wealthy, like some of the casino owners, like a lot of people you know, that, that, that own huge corporations, they're on Mayor Goodman's side. It, it, it's, definitely, it's definitely more standard for people that stand to, bene- to benefit uh, financially to want to reopen things aggressively. De- definitely true. I've had a good career. Uh, I started with nothing. Every dollar I have, I made myself. Um, so, you know, I- I'm certainly in more of a position to benefit from that than the average person. But I also just want to be clear here. I'm not in the casino owner ballpark of wealth. You know, I've had a good career for, for what I've done. I'm proud of my accomplishments, but I don't stand to gain nearly as much as a lot of these other companies do. Um, in fact, my company is a online training site, right? So we are still doing just fine from a business standpoint. In fact, more people are wanting to learn about how to play poker online than they were before. So, um, you know, it doesn't really stand to, to benefit me in any way. But as far as do wealthier people want things to reopen? Yeah, because they're not in the front lines and they make money from it. Uh, and I think that they're, what they say and their actions speak for themselves. I have to ask you one poker question here, Doug. When the casinos open, let's say it's June 18th and, and uh, the, the unions get their 90 days to finish their contracts, whatever, how, how far after the casinos open do you think that poker rooms will actually open? That's a good question. Poker Poker is really dicey because – when you think about the logistics of playing poker, you're handling cards, you're handling chips, and you're passing them around. You're just hoping that more come your way than go out, go out the other way. Um, how, how does that look in a world of people being afraid of coronavirus? It's, it's a bit dicey. It, it, it's something that has never been super sanitary. Uh, I know when you look at the movies, <laughs> it's always James Bond with plaques of million-dollar chips and stuff. Right. Uh, but the reality is there's lots of small denomination chips that get passed around quite frequently. So it's going to be a tough question. It, it, it's, it's really one of the, the, one of the toughest parts about, I think, coronavirus is sort of the lasting uh, implications in many different areas. What does this look like for sports in the future, right? Are, you, are we going to have stadiums? Well, is there going to be some kind of distance in place? Or at what point do we go back to normal? Do we ever go back to normal? What type of risk are we okay allowing ourselves in the future? These are questions that kind of have to be answered not just at the poker table, but sort of in a, uh, in a, in a macro, just like global scale. How are, what, what is acceptable for us in terms of risk? So yeah. I'm not sure what the answer to that might be. I could see it being some time and – uh, I, I think that the jury is out on exactly when we're going to see things return to normal. All right. He lied. A few more poker questions for you. Doug. <laughs> um, so you know, <laughs> you're, you're a guy that has, like I've said, I'm, I'm belaboring the point here, but you, you've won a lot of money playing poker. Just mention it 10 you're, more times. You're, perfect, ex- Brian. you're extremely y- I'm okay young. With it. I'm all right with you're, it. <laughs> you're young in the world of poker. Why go through the trouble of doing these training videos and all this other stuff and making a, a very small amount of money compared to what you were making with poker? Why retire from the game of poker? Explain to us that. Well, there's a couple of reasons. For the, the, real, the real bottom line, actually, is I, I just kind of lost the passion for playing. 
I just found myself when I sat there, I just, I didn't feel like I was being fulfilled any longer. And it's tough when you spent your life doing, uh, you, you, having a career in an area, and then you just realize you just don't want to do it. That's tough. Uh, it was tough realizing that. I kind of forced myself to play for a couple of years. Uh, I did well over those couple of years. It, it, it just, when I played, my heart wasn't in it, and I could tell that I wanted to move on to finding some other ventures. And uh, I think the first kind of natural step was trying try my hand at starting my own business uh, based around something that I'm very good at. So I, I knew that we could give our members something that sure. gave them a lot of value. So that was so, kind of the first sense. step. Yeah. Go, yep. Uh, that, no, that makes that makes complete sense to me. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. And by the way, I know what you're talking about when it comes to passions and things you know you, you love doing and maybe you know life is short you have to do what you enjoy and i totally get that uh not not at your pace but certainly i loved playing poker in my 20s and i got burnt out as well when i got to my 30s but uh the difference between you and me is you've made about probably 20 million dollars more than i have <laughs> at, at the poker table but i want to talk to you at poker in general you know i've been covering the world series of poker doug for gosh almost 20 years and i go there every year and it, it you know there are so many few people like yourself that have your own money to buy into your own events. So many people, I've seen some of the world's best, asking others for money, asking for backing. Many of these guys go broke. I, I, one of the first guys I met in Vegas 20 years ago was Mike Matisau. He's still in debt. I mean, Mike is a great character of the game, and I'm sure you know him well as, as well. But there are a lot of guys like Mike Matisau that have gambling addictions, that have sports betting addictions, or maybe it's blackjack. I remember T.J. Cloutier. I saw him lose a hundred grand at the craps table, and then the next day I saw him asking people for money to get into a World Series of Poker event. Phil Ivey, another guy that just explodes through money, great poker player. What does it say about your sport, or if you want to call it game, that you've been involved with for so many years, that there are so many few people that have the wherewithal to, or, or that don't have the vices, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that they don't have to ask, you know, so many are asking others for money. I mean, and they call themselves professionals. What does that mean as far as poker is concerned or professional poker? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think that there's a clear line between uh, sort of the two generations of poker players. You know, I, want, I, want, I, I put it like this. If you think about poker, let's just say 60 years ago, right? Who were people that played poker? Well, it was a lot of Wild West cowboys and and whatever was Amarillo. happening. I, I'm yeah. not – maybe longer longer ago than that, right? Yeah. Um, but there were people playing poker in games that were underground or, you know, there might have been cheating or, or – it, it was a more dangerous game back then, right? And so the people that might have been good at poker 50 or 100 years ago, well, they wouldn't be good at poker today because the strategies have evolved. And I think that the online poker boom – Think, I think like 2004-ish time period, 2005-ish, uh, I think that we really saw a new wave of poker players come up, poker players that were much more professional. If you came up in online poker around that time period, maybe 2010 and afterwards, you had to be really good and you, because the competition was fierce. People were using software. People were extremely talented. People were working day and night. People could play however many tables online at once. And so I think that a lot of the newer generation of poker players that have reached the top, they don't have a lot of those same problems because if they did, they wouldn't be there. That's not the case for the people that were there 20, 30 years ago. You know, you think about Mike Matisau. Mike Matisau uh, was probably a fantastic poker player when he was coming up in the game, right? But if you look at his game today versus a lot of the top pros, he's not going to compare. And so I, I think that there's this divide where the younger generation – that came up through these top online games, they're really good. Now, even within that group, there are people that have problems because it is gambling, and there are people that become addicted to gambling and right. and, and have these other vices that, that create issues for them. But at the same time, you know what? There are people in every industry that are, you know, in, into things they shouldn't be and lose their money doing dumb shit. Poker is just another one of those things. <laughs> I totally agree. It, it does seem to be the, the case that the younger players seem to take it more seriously, and they don't have they don't they don't have access to all those vices because they're you know a, a lot of cases they're sitting in front of their computer. You know, speaking of you know speaking of online poker, Doug, you were one of the biggest. I mean, Brian mentioned the tournament winners. You were actually one of the biggest you know one on one heads up cash game players um, in, in online poker history. Tell me the biggest one on one cash game matchup you had in online poker. I have I've had a lot of, of big battles. That that was definitely my preferred game type was one on one poker. It's a 
it's an interesting game, right? Because it's very direct. Anytime you lose, the guy across from you wins and vice versa. So it's not for the faint of heart. And I think because of that, a lot of people don't like it. It's a bit too intense. There are good things and bad things about it. Go ahead. Oh, no, I, 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 wasn't, I didn't say anything. I wasn't trying to interrupt you, but I wanted to ask you about Dan Bilzerian. Is that okay? I wanted to bring that up because sure. uh, I think there are guys like yourself who have, and, and again, I'm not kissing your ass here. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you because you did it all by yourself. You didn't have a family that said, here you go, son, here's $10 million. Knock yourself out, play some poker. There's people like you, and I'm not a big Dan Bilzerian fan, and the reason why I say that is because he comes from an extremely wealthy family. And he gets more girls than Brian does. Oh, I don't care about that. Yes, that's, you do. That's got nothing to do with it. Uh, no, it really, <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't. But he calls himself, doesn't it bother you, when somebody wins the World Series of Poker and they have moderate poker skills and they just run like God for two weeks, or a guy like a Dan Bilzerian who calls himself a professional poker player, most of the poker pros that I talk to say he's a donkey, and he's a guy just with a lot of money that has moderate poker skills that calls himself a professional poker player, and he claims that's where he won all his money. I certainly don't believe him. What do you say? If you're looking for justice, I'd recommend becoming an attorney and staying out of poker um, because <laughs> in poker, anybody can win. If you if you have money at the start, that could be a huge boost. If you get the right run of cards at the right place, you take the right shot, it can all work out for you. It can also do the opposite you, you could do all the things correctly you could play as well as you could you could study hard you could work hard and then in that critical all-in moment you lose i had a successful career before getting into tournaments i had a successful ter- tournament career i would be lying if i said that i didn't have a few moments in those big tournaments that i played if i had lost it all in i don't win that tournament i'd be lying right i mean without without winning those clutch moments sure um i would i wouldn't have had the success that i had Right. There's no, there's no like fairness like that. It's just about the cards. You play, you play your best, and you play well. You're more likely to win than lose. In the long run, you'll get them. But day to day, who knows? As for Dan Bilzerian specifically, that story is just, it's just funny to me because, you know, like his family just had so much money. You look at his dad, who got in trouble for corporate raiding back in the '80s, um, and then a lot of the money just seemed to disappear, and all of a sudden Dan Bilzerian's playing high stakes. Now look. Yeah. Did he actually win money playing in private games? I could see that. I mean, he's going to be playing against people that are quite bad for tons of money. He might have won right. there, but that's not where he got his money from originally, at exactly. least to the best of my knowledge. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, let me say this, Doug. I think you're, you're a really honest guy, and I appreciate you answering all of our questions. And I appreciate the fact that you care about this city and that you're doing what you think is the right thing to do. And by the way, I'm not against what you're doing either. I'm on your side. Doug, we'd love to have you on again uh, down the road. And, and, and if you need any help with this or you want to spread the word, we're more than glad to do that and have you on again. You're an extremely smart guy, and uh, we appreciate your insight. Uh, Doug, keep up the good work, and uh, hopefully we can have you on again sometime soon. That would, that would be awesome. Thank you for having me on. If people want to learn more about the recall effort, they can head over to lvrecall.com. They can learn about what they can do, uh, especially if you voted in the last mayoral election in Vegas. Uh, it would be much appreciated if you reached out to us and we got your signature. If you, you want bet. to have the mayor recalled. You bet. Doug, I appreciate your time, my friend. I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks a lot, Doug. Sounds All great. Right. There you, you go. go. Thanks, Doug. Uh, there you go. Doug Polk, uh, one of the guys in charge uh, of getting this thing going. He's trying to recall the mayor, Carolyn Goodman, and I actually think he's going to be successful yeah, in I think doing he's, so. I mean, if, if he's only got to do 25% of 27,000 votes, I mean, I agree.